but I will hand over to Dr. Ward, who will okay. entertain us. Well, thank you. Um, can I ask, this is just for my own information, is anyone here who's worked in the electrical power industry in the UK? How many, any hands up? One, two, three, four. Okay, small number. Okay. Um, I'll try not to speak in a way that's condescending for someone who's <laughs> an engineer. Okay. Um, okay, very brief summary. Um, there will be a brief introduction. Then I'll explain what the electricity industry in the UK was like at privatization in 1990. Then I will talk about the first 11 years after privatization, we so-called electricity pool and what changed in that period. Um, and then it changed in 2001 and 2005. And then I'll talk about the changes that happened after that uh, and the situation as it is today. And then I will talk about the future. Only as you all know, any predictions about the future are always rather doubtful. <laughs> so. So this is my one slide of introduction. Um, electricity demand in the country varies. It varies with time of day, it varies with time of year, it varies with the weather. Uh, this graph shows you uh, demand in Great Britain, that's England, Scotland and Wales, as it was in 2005. I chose that year for a particularly good reason. Um, the top line is the winter peak, which in that year, happened at the end of November. And the bottom is the sun, summer minimum, which always is a Sunday in summer. <coughs> um, and the two lines in between are typical winter day and typical summer day. Um, one important thing that you need to remember is um, the public electricity system uh, doesn't have any significant storage. Therefore, what goes in must equal what comes out plus losses. Uh, and it has to balance not just over the day or on average over the year, it actually has to balance more or less every second by second. This is a bit different from the gas system, which has to balance on the day, or the water system, which often has weeks worth of storage in reservoirs. We don't have that on the electricity system. That's very important, um, and I'll mention it again at the end. But uh, so a key point of electricity systems, is you've got to be able to adjust the generation to match the demand. So before privatization in 1990, how was the system? Well, at that time, Great Britain was a single interconnected electrical network. Everywhere in Great Britain was connected to the same network, except for the Shetland Islands and the Shetland and Islands are still not connected. Um, the Isle of Man was not connected, but technically the Isle of Man is not part of Great Britain. Um, the red line on the chart shows a link to France. That was in service from about 1985, and I was partly involved in the commissioning of that. Um, and there were no links to Ireland or any other countries, but it was a single network. Um, but there were. it was like three different countries in one way, because uh, Scotland was divided into two areas and England and Wales was the third area and they traded across the border in the same way, for example, that Netherlands trades with Belgium. So it was one network, but we traded across the borders. Hang on, page. Oh, have I mucked it up? Or do I need to? Ah. Oh, yes, if you... You might have to click on it to, uh, to then tell it. Ah, it. Right. So how was it? In England and Wales, there was a single company, the Central Electricity Generating Board, which I joined in 1974, divided into five regions. And they owned virtually all the generation, virtually all the power stations in England and Wales, actually about 99% of the capacity. They also own the transmission system, that is the pylons that march across the country at 400,000 volts and 275,000 volts. Um, and they also had the national control center and actually six regional control centers because one of the regions southeast was split into two areas for control. So they controlled the system, they, they had all the generation, they had all the transmission. And then there were 12 regional companies which I think we called area boards at that time. Um, they owned the wires at lower voltage. That includes the low voltage wires that go to your home. Uh, 
but mostly they owned everything from 132 kilovolts down and they had to operate that. Uh, and their other function was to buy electricity wholesale from the CEGB and to sell it retail to customers like you and me. So they had two distinct functions. One was owning and operating the wires and the other was buying and selling electricity. And all of those organisations were state owned. In Scotland, it was slightly different. There were two companies, the South of Scotland Electricity Board and the North of Scotland Hydroelectric Board. Um, each of them owned almost all the power stations in their area. They also, like the CEGB, owned the transmission system, the high voltage system, and they each had a control centre that controlled their networks. But in addition, instead of having a separate area board, they themselves were the area board, so they also ran the low voltage wires and sold electricity uh, retail to individual customers. But they also traded electricity wholesale with each other and with the CEGB. Mostly the trade went from Scotland to England. And they were also state owned. <coughs> what about the generation that we had? Well, I'm showing you a coal fired station first because the generation at that time was dominated by coal. This is a photograph of Drax, which at the time was the largest coal fired power station in Europe. Uh, most of its units have now been converted to burn wood chip. So it's no longer a coal fired power station. Uh, we had nuclear power stations. Uh, there were 11 Magnox power stations, but one of them, Barclay, had already closed a year before privatisation. We had seven AGR power stations, each with two reactors in operation. There were a couple of experimental reactors at Dune Ray and at Winfrith. Um, and there was one pressurised water reactor. Construction had just started. That was size will be. Construction had started. Um, and three more were planned. They planned to the extent that the project manager had been appointed for each of the other three. I think uh, more than that. It was supposed to be seven or eight. The plan as it was in 1990 was for four. I have heard people say that there were more than that before, but the plan in 1990, as it was told to us at the time, was that there were four. They're going to be four, and they'll all be the same. We're not going to make the mistake of making them all different like the AGRs. They're all going to be the same. Yeah, so we, we're building in front of them and Wilfer and uh, Higley. They were, the, 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 the four planned were size will be, Wilfer B, Hinkley C and size will C, but not necessarily in that order. Um, anyway, size will be was already just about started and I was involved in some of the work for size wealth. We also had oil fired power stations. I'm, uh, <coughs> the price of oil was below the price of coal in the 1960s. Therefore, the CGB took the decision to convert some of the older coal stations to oil and to build some new oil stations. And this was the last newest one, Littlebrook in Kent near the Dartford Tunnel. It's now been demolished. Um, we also had some hydroelectric plants, though not very much. This is a photo of the dam at Rydol in West Wales, 50 megawatts. Um, there's a reasonable amount of hydroelectricity in Scotland, about 1,000 megawatts. There's a moderate, tiny amount in Wales, 100 megawatts, and almost zero in England. Uh, tot in total, the hydro station has only produced about 1% of our electricity. Uh, this is a bit unfortunate because in most countries in Europe, Hydro produces 20, 30% of the electricity. And hydro is very useful because it's very flexible. You can start a hydro unit from completely shut down. It could be in full load in a couple of minutes, depending on the design. Um, and they don't mind going up to full power, down to half power, up to full power, and they're off several times in the morning. Uh, you can't do that with a coal-fired power station. So because of that, because we didn't have much time Hydro. Um, both CGB and the Scottish companies built some pump storage hydro. That's just like a hydro station, only at night you can pump the water back up to the top. So it's not really a source of energy, but it is a very large storage facility. Uh, there were four in total. Uh, there are still only four, but there are plans for lots more. Uh, there's some pr those pretty pictures of Festinian in North Wales and Cruachan, 
which is like Dinorwick, is inside a mountain in southern Scotland. Um, but just to summarise, this pie chart shows the generation sources in 1990. You can see that <laughs> two thirds of the generation came from coal fired power stations, nearly a fifth from nuclear, and then the rest from a variety of oil, hydro, other, and imports from France. Uh, you notice that gas is a very small slice. A couple of the coal fired power stations have been modified so that they could burn gas when it was available cheaply. So what happened after privatization in 1990? Um, the first arrangement was called the electricity pool and for wholesale trading purposes, it very much mimicked what the CEGB did with its own power stations. The, C the power stations told national control every day how much they could generate tomorrow and what the cost was. And then national control ran a computer bit of software to produce the optimum schedule for running the plant for minimum cost. The only change under the electricity pool is instead of telling the cost, you told the price and same software to try and get the minimum cost solution. <coughs> so what was the electricity market in England was after privatization? Well, the CEGB was broken up. Um, in terms of generation, it was broken into three companies. It was originally going to be two, and then they decided nuclear should be separate. The Power Gen and National Power, uh, they got about a third and two thirds of the non-nuclear stations, and then Nuclear Electric got the nuclear stations. Uh, transmission and system control went to National Grid Company. So the people who worked at the National Control Centre in central London, they joined National Grid. Uh, the people who worked at the various substations around the country, they all joined National Grid. And finally, the distribution and supply companies, the 12 regional electricity companies, 12 area boards became 12 regional electricity companies, and they had the same function. They had to um, own and operate and manage the wires, and they had to sell electricity the, the, so that the power stations would sell uh, wholesale electricity to the world regional companies and they would sell to customers. And all of those were privatized except nuclear electric. That after a lot of argument, it was decided nuclear electric would remain in public ownership for the time being. Of course, deregulation meant that you had to have a regulator to regulate the business. So the original regulator was called OFE, the Office for Electricity Regulation. But later in 2000, it was merged with the gas regulator, Ofgas, to form Ofgem, the, the Office of Gas. And as far as the electricity business is concerned, the Electricity Act 1989 invented the concept of licenses, and there were at least four different types of licenses, generation license, transmission license, distribution license, and supply license. And there were rules associated with being a license holder. A lot of them were to do with uh, the money and behaving in a correct manner as far as the money is concerned. Um, there were some exemptions. So if you were a small generator, so that you had less than 10 megawatts of capacity, you were license exempt. You didn't need to have a license. I'm not sure about distribution and other licenses, uh, but generally everyone was subject to a license. In the case of National Grid, the transmission license has got lots of rules for how they operate the system, which basically the old CGB rules. Uh, it's very important that companies obey the license because if you deliberately and repeatedly breach a license, the regulator can fine you up to 10% of turnover. That's never happened to anybody if you've all been a bit too careful. Um, this, these are the kind of the aims of, of the regulator as it was seen in 1990, the aim was uh, anything that the regulator can do to lower prices for customers is a good thing. Uh, they needed to tightly regulate natural monopolies. National Grid, running the transmission system for the whole of England and Wales, had a monopoly. And the regional electricity companies that run their networks, running the network was a monopoly. Therefore, it has to be tightly regulated. And a, a philosophy that Stephen Littlechild, the head of off offer, uh, followed was he wanted to maximize commercial competition and he wanted to seek market solutions for any problem. 
So if there is a problem, devise a way in which you can make it biddable by in a market. Uh, and that's the right thing to do, according to him. Uh, Offer basically is a large organization with lots and lots of lawyers and economists and very, very few engineers, which I think is a bad thing, but that's the way they're organized. So they're far more interested in money than they are in technical problems. <laughs> So what happened in the election of the deep war between 1990 and 2001? Well, in 1995, size will be PWR was completed and entered service. At the same time, the nuclear company, Nuclear Electric, was split into two. The older reactors, the Magnox reactors, were retained in government ownership. That's the company I work for. And the AGRs and size will be became part of British British Energy, which is a nuclear company. So the Magnox stations were not privatized and some of them started to close down. Uh, Hunterston A, Trouswinnith and Hinkley A all closed before, 19, before 2001. Lots of new power stations were built, hence the slide showing lots of power stations. And almost all of the new power stations were gas fired, combined cycle gas turbines. And to build these new <coughs> gas-fired uh, gas turbine stations, there were a lot of new companies. So National Power and PowerGen, each of them built new power stations. But then lots of new companies came along and said, we want to build a power station. So Enron sponsored one at Teesside. Um, and a lot of these companies were like single project companies owned by a bank uh, and a group of engineers developed the power station. So you had lots of independent uh, power stations. So there were lots of new generating companies. Um, I knew Barking Power quite well. Barking Power owned and operated Barking Power Station, 1,000 megawatts. Interestingly, they had one employee. Uh, I, uh, I met a Japanese economics professor, and he'd found this out, and he couldn't understand how a power station could have one employee. And it's easy. He worries about the money. And the power stations operated by another company that has 70 employees. Um, so um, the other thing that happened was the distribution companies who are, I mentioned have two functions. One is to own and operate the wires. The other was to sell electricity retail. They were split in the sense that the companies had to be two legally separate companies with a Chinese war between them. Um, the idea was eventually supply will become a separate business. And then some new companies were set up. These were mostly companies selling wholesale to industries. So a, a, com a supply company is one that buys wholesale, sells retail. So uh, other changes. Um, there was a move towards vertical integration. So ge generating companies like National Power and PowerGen bought a supply business of one or more of the regional electricity companies. Some supply companies, on the other hand, bought generation. So Eastern was one that did that. There were many changes of company ownership. Um, some of the new companies that had been set up to build CCGT power stations were bought by French, German, American companies. And then from 1998, all customers could choose their supplier. Up till then, only large industrial customers who had special meters. Mm -hmm. Uh, could choose who they bought their electricity from. But to encourage competition from 1998, all customers could choose who they buy their electricity from. So you've got a bit of advertising and people knocking on doors. Um, and you, people are wondering why Scottish Power wants to sell them electricity when they live in Brighton. Um, but it's, you know, it's just money. Um, some companies <clears throat> became foreign owned. Uh, that represents the kind of nationalities of some of the companies. And then other companies diversified, diversified into gas, water and telecoms. So um, I had shares in Northwest Electricity and I had shares in Northwest Water. Suddenly they became the same company. And I cannot now remember which one went into telecoms, to be honest, I can't remember. Um, so I mentioned that most of the new power stations built were gas fired, combined cycle gas turbines. And this is a picture of one of them. This is Rye House. It's still in operation. I think it was commissioned in about 1992 and it's still in operation for, as far as I can find out. 
why why were they gas why did people build gas fired ccgts uh they are cheaper and quicker to build than a coal-fired power station well why hadn't the cgb built lots of these before one reason was until shortly before privatization there was an eu directive discouraging the use of gas for electricity generation and this was kind of overturned in the late 1980s and Britain and Netherlands, for example, took full advantage of that and built loads of gas-fired power stations. So quicker to build, cheaper to build. The fuel is cheaper than coal. So it was a, a no-brainer that that was the preferred form of generation for new power plants. Um, this shows you the, uh, the change. These, uh, the colored bands show the different forms of generation. This orange band is coal and oil, and this green band is gas. So you can see that from shortly after privatization up to 2001, the amount of generation from gas has dramatically increased. Uh, that from coal and oil has significantly reduced, but it hasn't disappeared. Nuclear actually increased a bit because of size will be, then reduced a bit because Hinkley, Hinkley B closing, Hinkley A closing. Uh, and the green band, which is renewables and pump storage, that's hydro, wind, solar, hardly changed. You have to look very carefully to see that any change at all. So although there were some wind turbines built at that time, that not very many. And then, <coughs> Why was there a big change in 2001? The electricity regulator, Stephen Littlechild, was not happy. He thought our electricity arrangements were not competitive enough. And one sign was, look at the average wholesale price. It's not falling. He's an economist. If you build lots of new power stations, the price ought to go down. It had gone down a little bit, not much. Therefore, we need to change the market arrangements to introduce competition. Uh, and that's what... Uh, they did. So the market arrangements have changed in England and Wales from the March 2001. I haven't really mentioned Scotland, which was complicated and different. But in 2005, all that happened was <coughs> England and Wales trading arrangements were expanded to Scotland. So by then, the whole of Great Britain became a single trading organisation. There was no longer a trading border between Scotland and England. A national grid company as the system operator for England and Wales also became the system operator for Scotland. So that, that, that's how you went in two stages. So why did the regulator um, introduce the new trading arrangements? Well, there was a whole list of reasons. And this, these bullet points come from a presentation I went to in about 1999 or 2000. Um, I won't go into detail. There's a good economic argument as to why they needed to change the electricity pool. Uh, those of us who worked in generation were not that happy because it was a really big shake up and we didn't know what would happen. <coughs> it also meant that companies now had to spend a, invest a lot of more money into their trading department. So some of us complained that this was like money down the drain. You know, you're not investing in plants, you're investing in people and computer systems to do trading. So what happened to electricity prices? Um, so this is the start of NETA. You'll see that the forward, this is a, the price here is the annual base load price for the year ahead. If you compare it with the previous pool price, it's significantly lower. And then it fell over the first year until it reached a minimum in the summer of 2002. This is people selling contracts for the following 12 months uh, a bit of a problem there. Um, British Energy was in severe trouble. Uh, it, this coincided with them having needing some money because they were trying to buy some nuclear stations in Canada. They couldn't. They effectively went bust because the, the forward price was now below their operating costs. Um, there's a few headlines from the time. Um, and there was big arguments. What does the government do? The trouble is British energy was too big to be allowed to fail. It's a bit like the banks in 2008. It was too big to be allowed to fail. What actually happened was effectively the government gave them a lot of money and became part owners. And those of us who had shares in British energy, which I did, 
because I worked in the industry, uh, <clears throat> we saw our value of our shares go right down. But they were not the only organization, lots of other companies. I mentioned TXU Energy. TXU Energy was a European subsidiary of Texas Utilities. They'd gone into the British market in a big way and they, they declared bankruptcy. And that was a problem because lots of other companies had trading contracts with them, including AES Drax, who now own Drax Power Station. Uh, and they were in severe difficulties because of TXU going bust. And they weren't the only ones. Um, so th there was a, a big knock-on effect. And some of these independent gas turbine power stations, uh, single company, single power station, they were in severe trouble as well. And what happened in some cases, they basically had a, I don't know, a distressed sale so that they were sold off for less than half what it cost to build them. To, so that certain companies like National Power and Power Gen uh, managed, and Scottish Power, managed to do quite well to accumulate a few power stations on the cheap. And then some power stations were mothballed. That is, they weren't sold or scrapped, but they were put into a safe state so they could be brought back at some time in the future. Um, this is a, an extended view of the previous graph. So you need to start prices for British energy is in trouble. TXU goes bankrupt. Um, a number of power plants close and then power prices rise. So uh, the, correct, the correct thing to have done was to, if you could, was to sit it out and the prices rose dramatically. Part of the reason for the rise in prices was plants closing part was the rise in the price of gas. Actually, if you draw the price of gas on the same chart, it matches it all very closely. So what's changed since uh, 2001, 2005, when there were market changes and today, quite a lot of changes. So an, a number of nuclear power stations have closed. In fact, um, by today, all the Magnox power stations have closed. The very last one was Wilver Unit 2, which shut down in December 2015. Uh, and three of the AGR stations have now closed. That's Dungeon SB, uh, Hunterston B, and Hinkley Point B. They've all closed. Um, and of course, the, uh, the two prototype uh, experimental reactors I mentioned right at the beginning, they actually closed in about 1991. Um, Almost all the oil and coal stations have closed. As I speak to you today, the only coal station that's still operating is Ratcliffe on Sower. There were two other coal stations that formally closed earlier this year, but the government has um, persuaded them with the, with the help of a bit of money to say they're still available if necessary, if there's a problem this winter. So that's uh, West Burton and uh, Dra the last unit at Drax. A number of the older gas-fired CCGT stations have closed. The, the CGB coal stations generally operated for 40 to 50 years. Some of them closed earlier than that, but most of them did. We did well over 40 years. The first two big CCGT stations, that's Teesside and Barking, both closed in less than 20 years from their commissioning date, which uh, I think is something's wrong. Uh, construction has started at Hinkley point C. Uh, that didn't really start until the end of 2016. Um, and we've had lots of new international connections. The earlier chart showed us connected to France. Well, there's another map I'll show you in a few minutes showing a lot more connections. Um, I use the polite word additional financial assistance that was been provided to renewable sources of generation. You're not allowed to call them subsidies. Um, there were some special arrangements under the electricity pool, but they didn't work very well and they weren't very generous. Net result was not many wind turbines got built. Since then, we've had renewable obligation certificates, we've had feed-in tariffs, we've had capital grants, and we now have contracts for differences, all of which provide significant financial assistance to the right sort of renewable. And as a consequence of that, there has been a rapid growth in renewable generation, which you'll see in the, some more slides, which I'm going to show you. Um, another thing perhaps you're not aware of, electricity demand was going up. 
in the early days in the 1960s and up till 1972, electricity demand was growing about seven or eight percent per year. So that meant it doubled every seven years. Um, from in the recent past, it was going up at about one or two percent a year. It's peaked and it's now coming down. Uh, and I've not yet seen a good explanation as to why that's the case. But there's the graph. Um, you can see we were privatized in 1990 and electricity demand kept going up at the same rate, about one or two percent a year until 2005. And since then, it's been coming down about one or two percent a year. If you look very, very carefully, you can see that industrial demand fell in 2020 because of COVID, but it's now picked up a little bit. This is interesting because there's all these forecasts about electric demand having to go up because of all the electric vehicles we're all going to buy, but there's no sign of it yet. Um, this now shows you all the international connections that we have, plus the connection to the Isle of Man. Um, all of the connections except the Isle of Man are direct current, high voltage direct current connections. So we've got effectively three to France, one to Belgium, one to Netherlands, one to Norway, one to Northern Ireland, one to the Republic of Ireland. Uh, the one to Norway is the longest undersea HVDC connection in the world. Uh, <clears throat> So you can see that there is the opportunity for a large amount of importing and exporting of power. All of these are now in service and a lot more are planned, which I'll mention a bit later. Um, there's been a dramatic growth in the number and also the size of wind turbines. Um, this is a, a chart from an American trade magazine, Renewable Energy World, and it's actually quite old, it's 2017. And it showed the growth in size of onshore land-based turbines um, in North America. Um, and it estimated that by 2030, there would be 3.25 megawatt wind turbines. Um, let me consult my notes. Um, yeah, in, in Britain, we've had some 3.4 megawatt wind turbines onshore as early as 2014. So uh, the growth in size is actually faster than uh, the Americans were predicting. Bearing in mind, this is a trade magazine. This isn't a popular magazine. So, uh, but there is an issue on land, uh, the maximum size of wind turbine you can build is of course constrained by the maximum indivisible load that you can transport by road. Uh, the blades are single piece, so that's the longest. Um, and then the bottom section of the tower is probably the heaviest part, and that ultimately limits the size of what you can build. At sea, you don't have this limit. You have really the, the limit of the ship you've got that's going to assemble it. Um, again, this is an American view of what offshore wind turbines would be like. Uh, and they were predicting 11 megawatts being available by... 2030. Again, uh, things have happened rather faster than their prediction. Uh, let me see, I'll look at my notes. Uh, three companies, that Siemens Gamisa from Germany, Vestas from Denmark and GE in the US, have all demonstrated 14 or 15 megawatt designs and have got contracts for installing them in the North Sea. I don't think any are yet in service. Um, so, by 2022, we're already talking about wind turbines significantly larger than the ones that were being predicted back in 2017. We now have solar PV. Um, some people who got in early got a very high feed-in tariff. My brother did. He's got solar panels on his roof and he's, he's a medical doctor, not an electrical engineer. And he's very pleased with them. Um, but there is still some kind of financial assistance to solar PV systems. And I've shown here what I believe is the largest solar PV system in the UK, Shotwick Solar Park in Flintshire. Um, actually, I think this is not, I'm not sure, but I think this is not connected to the public electricity system. I think it's a standalone system that provides power to the company that owns it for its factory. 
the, the other photograph shows a typical domestic rooftop, which could produce two to four kilowatts um, in summer, midday, um, of course, nothing at night. Um, I don't know what the subsidy position is on these at the moment. I don't think there is any. There was a very generous subsidy, which my brother got, but um, I don't know. But the consequence of this, a lot of solar panels have been installed. Um, there's also generation from biofuels, uh, and actually this is dominated by Drax. Drax coal-fired power station has converted at least four of its units to be able to burn wood chip, which they import from the States. And this counts as a biofuel and it attracts a subsidy, sorry, financial assistance from the government. Um, there's also a lot of other biofuels and they're all very small power stations. And I've listed the sorts of stuff they burn um, and they're all small. The reason they're small is that's about the maximum you can build for the fuel that's available locally. A big issue with these is the cost of transport of the fuel. And if it's more than a half a day's drive on a lorry, it's really not worth doing. So these are in locations where they can burn forestry waste or straw or poultry litter. Uh, another interesting thing for them is their fuel may have a negative price. In other words, it's what's called a gate fee fuel. You have to pay them to take it. I did meet somebody who worked at one of these stations. I cannot remember which one. And they did rather well the last time we had foot and mouth disease, which was about 15 years ago. Um, they were paid quite a lot of money to burn dead cows. It's unpleasant, but it's a form of biofuel generation. Uh, another one that, that not many people know about that was quite significant, uh, old, landfill sites um, i can remember the typical municipal rubbish tip people just tipped everything on it that included stuff that was, that was biodegradable and which as it decomposed would produce methane and there were a number of serious health issues where methane from a landfill site crept through the soil and ended up in the basement of buildings nearby causing an explosion hazard and that kind of thing um, and then it was realised that one way of getting rid of this gas is to burn it to generate electricity. So there was a special financial arrangement to encourage companies to install small plants on old rubbish tips to extract the methane, burn it, generate electricity. So it's biofuel and it also gets rid of a hazard. Of course, it's not a hazard that's going to last forever because we no longer have big rubbish tips of that sort. Um, but interestingly, um, it was produced at one time, it was producing 1.8% of all our electricity. That's more than all our hydro. And in fact, it was more than all of our solar and all of our wind put together until at least 2007. I mean, I can remember the British Wind Energy Association uh, boasting how much wind generation we'd installed in the country and me thinking, but actually, landfill gas is generating more than the wind turbines. That was true until 2007. Um, the, the output from these, uh, because of course the methane is gradually being used up and there won't be any on any new landfill sites. I mean, there are hundreds of these, but they're all quite small. Wave and tidal power. Uh, over dinner, somebody did mention this. The big trouble with wave power is that the amount of energy that's around in a storm is huge. And the difficulty is how you make a wave power device that will survive a really severe storm at sea and yet be usable. Um, anyway, the top one, um, I thought this was rather a good design. Uh, it really is robust. It's basically a concrete box on the coast. Um, and it's an oscillating water column. As the waves go up and down, they force air through the green thing you can see, which is actually the generator and the silencer. Um, and it is indeed very robust. But the problem with it wasn't very successful. The amount of electricity it generated was much less than they had predicted based on the, the arrangement. Um, it ran for a few years uh, as an experimental thing and has now been decommissioned. There's nothing left except the large concrete box. But it wasn't totally wasted because um, a company that partly sponsored it has actually built an, uh, some like this in Portugal. But the ones it built were very small. So it built a row of 10 small ones rather than one large one. That was supposed to be about one megawatt, but it never got there. 
The second one is um, Pelamis. It's a, a, a number of cylinders in a line float, and that it's using the bending caused by the wave movement. Uh, and it, several prototypes were built and tested. Uh, there are a couple off the north coast of Scotland in being tested. A couple were built in Portugal and tested. Uh, the company ceased trading. I believe it's because it costs far too much. And the cost of wind turbines uh, has come right down. That one you can see is about a one megawatt. You know, and a one megawatt wind turbine is not big these days. Uh, so unfor <laughs> that's unfortunate. Uh, the bottom one is a tidal stream turbine. This is rather like having a wind turbine, but it's underwater and it, it relies on the flow. So you put it somewhere in the sea where there's a steady current in one direction, preferably. And off the north coast of Scotland is a good place. Um, a number of different companies have produced prototypes of this sort of thing. Uh, and Maygen say, say their prototypes work well. Uh, and they've got uh, plans to build a, an array I think the one you can see is about one megawatt. So the plan would be several dozen of those in, in one location. So they are planned, but I really don't know the current status of it. Uh, if you look at the websites of these companies, they tend to be rather optimistic, but not actually fact filled. So it's difficult to work out. Uh, what's happened to our nuclear power stations? Well, all of the Magnox and experimental uh, reactors shut down. The experimental ones by 1992. The last Magnox shut down at the end of 2015. Uh, we have seven AGR stations, two reactors at each station, three are now closed. Uh, and the pressurized water reactors, size will be, is in operation quite successfully. And then we've got Hinkley Point C under construction. And I don't know how many you can say we have planned the government has kind of given approval to size to size we'll see, but I can see no evidence that it's gone beyond that point. Um, they certainly haven't signed an agreement with National Grid to connect there. So I don't know what's going to happen there. Um, <clears throat> this is a, uh, an updated chart of how uh, of electricity sources. Um, which is an expanded part of the one I showed you earlier. It goes up to 2021. Um, you can see that the green bit at the top, which is uh, renewables and pump storage, has got a lot larger. I mean, that's because <coughs> since about 2005, a dramatic growth in wind turbines and <coughs> solar panels. Nuclear's got smaller as the nuclear stations have closed, and the fraction from gas has remained about the same but other uh, thermal, coal and oil has gone right down. And unfortunately, the government figures here mix up biofuel from Drax with coal and oil. So the orange bit is not as small as all that. That's the same thing as the pie chart. And just to confuse you, this is all government statistics. Um, it comes from a different table. In this one, uh, thermal renewables are mixed in with renewables. So Drax and the... Uh, uh, other biofuels are shown there as orange as a subsection of the green bit. So you can see roughly just over a third is gas, just over a third is renewables, um, and rather less than a third is everything else. Um, you can see that again, imports, that's net imports because we import and export. That's the net import to the country is about 7%. So we import far more from Ireland, France, Belgium, Netherlands, and Norway than we export. So we do a bit of both. So the future, we're doing all right at the time. Um, well, so I, a graph I showed you, the demand is currently falling one or two percent a year, but it's predicted to increase a lot because of electric vehicles and electrification of heat and so on. But I have really not seen a decent prediction of how much and when and evidence to support it. I mentioned that there's only one coal-fired power station still nominally in operation, Ratcliffe on Sower, and its owners have said it will cease generation in September 2024, if not before. More HVDC connectors are planned. I showed you a, a map with all the red lines on it of all the existing international connections. Well, lots more are planned. 
and a lot more wind turbines and solar farms are planned. And new pump storage is planned. I, at the beginning, I said we've got four pump storage power plants in Great Britain. Uh, none have been, none new ones have been built since 1990, but a number are planned now. And if they are built by 2030, which is the prediction, that will more than double the, the capacity of pump storage. That's quite important because what do you do on a day when it's very windy but demand is low? you can use it to fill up your pump storage store and then on the following day when demand is high and wind is low you can um, balance it with your pump storage uh, so the presence of solar and wind on the system places a lot of benefit in being able to have storage and um, pump storage is a good way of having a large amount but it depends on geography so the new pump storage things planned are all in the north of Scotland. And I would say at this stage, it's unclear if any more nuclear power stations will be built. Um, the government has a plan or a proposal. Uh, the Green Lobby are very much opposed to it. And it looks like the main problem is money. Um, Hinckley C is, is expensive and it's actually turning out to be more expensive than their best predictions. So, Undersea connections, uh, the red lines, the solid red lines are the ones I showed you earlier. And the dotted ones are all ones that are planned. Uh, at least I can tell you how firmly planned they are. All those are companies which have signed an agreement with National Grid to connect. It doesn't mean they will connect, but what it means is at least they put some money up to pay for a formal application and to pay for a connection agreement. Um, but it's not, there are some which are not shown on there because they haven't yet signed with National Grid. There's been a lot in the press, if you read the appropriate mag technical magazines, about installing connections from a huge solar and wind farm in Morocco to connect in the southwest of England. Um, but there's no sign that they've actually um, come to an agreement with National Grid. Um, the one that's pointing sort of vertically upwards, I didn't know which way to put the arrow. That's the proposal to build a connection to Iceland. Iceland has potential for lots of hydropower, which is unused. And the proposal is to connect it and it's to connect it there, you know, in, in the middle part of Britain rather than north of Scotland. If it, if it goes ahead, it will be by far the longest undersea cable connection. So I have some doubt about whether that's viable. The other dotted ones go to Germany, Denmark, another one to Norway, another one to Belgium, and so on. Um, will they all be built? No idea, but they've all got connection agreements. What about wind farms? This is also from National Grid's data. Um, these are wind turbine, wind farms that have actually got signed agreements with National Grid. There's a slight problem. A small wind farm connected to a distribution network doesn't need an agreement with National Grid. Therefore, this doesn't include quite a large number of small wind farms. Um, but you can see, look at this number here. The, 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 sorry, this classif these classification is what it says in National Grid's database. Um, there's a huge capacity of people who've said to National Grid, we're planning to do this. We don't know exactly what we're gonna do, but this is roughly what we wanna do. Can we have a connection agreement, please? A national grid have said, okay, we'll take your money for that and we'll nominate you at connecting at this point at some point in the future. I just cannot believe that all that will get built. Um, so bearing in mind that the maximum demand on our system is a bit less than 60 uh, gigawatts. So this is this uh, that is a huge amount of wind. Uh, onshore. I'm not sure what to say because there's this at least six gigawatts not shown there because it's all the small wind farms. But I did a bit of hunting around last week and you can also get data from the website of Renewable UK, which is the trade organization. They present it rather differently. Uh, this shows you England, Wales and Scotland separately. And it's got the amount of uh, wind turbine capacity that's currently in operation, what's under construction, and what's got consent but not yet started construction. 
you will see that the government policy about discouraging wind farms on land in England and Wales is definitely effective. But it seems that in Scotland there is no such restriction. So uh, building new wind farms on land is still going on in Scotland, but not in England and Wales. Uh, and again, this is the, the note at the bottom, so that doesn't include very small wind turbines, uh, less than 100 kilowatts. I mean, somewhere near the M4, M5 junction, there's a rugby field that's got some wind turbines up, and they must be less than 100 kilowatts, and I've very rarely seen them spinning round. I think they're a waste of time. Right. What about problems? And I, I did a lot of work with National Grid when I was working, so I sort of understand their position. The National Grid Electricity System Operator is now a separate company from National Grid Transmission Owner. And I think the government has a long-term plan that National Grid Electricity System Operator will become a, a government-owned company. So that, uh, and I think National Grid don't mind because every time anything goes wrong, their control center gets the blame, even if it's not their fault, right? Problem system balancing. I slide I showed you right at the beginning, electricity demand varies. Unfortunately, now generation from wind and solar varies, and you have to vary the other generation or persuade demand to vary in order to balance the system. This is becoming a significant issue. Uh, if gas stations, gas fired power stations are providing the balancing, but actually only run a few hours a year because they're only needed on very high demand, very low wind days, then how on earth do they get paid for? I mean, this is a, an unanswered question as far as I'm concerned. Provision of reserve. Reserve means power stations which are shut down, but which can start up at short notice. So it's a very windy day, but then the a weather front crosses the country and the wind drops. So over a couple of hours, 10,000 megawatts of wind generation becomes 2,000 megawatts of wind generation and 8,000 megawatts has got to come from somewhere. Well, some of it will be imported from Ireland or Scotland or Norway, um, but you, you, you've got to provide available generation from somewhere. So that's another problem. Decreasing system inertia. Uh, technical point, all the generators and the turbines that are connected to them are in a sense flywheels. They store energy because of, by virtue of their rotation. Uh, and this helps the system control because it means that if a generating unit trips off, frequency starts to fall, but some of the energy comes from that stored energy in the inertia. So that large inertia on the system tends to make system frequency not move very fast. Unfortunately, all the coal, nearly all the coal stations, all the oil stations, and some of the nuclear stations, where their lovely big generators and turbines are now shut down. So the amount of inertia on the system is much less. So the system has become much jumpier than it was. The National Grid is now having to buy inertia, people installing flywheels, and National Grid paying them to do it, um, or paying a someone who has a battery system that can operate very fast to simulate inertia. So National Grid are now having to pay for something they used to get for free. And, and I think they don't get enough of it. Uh, decreasing fault levels is another technical issue. Um, again, synchronous generators, traditional generators provide a significant fault current if there's a fault on the system. You may think that's a bad thing, but actually it's needed to make electrical protection systems work to allow voltage to recover after a fault. Um, the power electronics from wind turbines, the power electronics from HVDC converters, the power electronics from solar panels doesn't provide anything like the same in feed. So it's a difference in the characteristic of the generation source that causes the problem to, uh, on the system. Sensitivity to transient events. This is a problem which is partly solved, but it's a problem because, shall we say, regulation didn't operate fast enough. Small generators, like the solar panel on the roof of your house, um, small wind turbines, uh, it was discovered and realized early on that they're a bit sensitive to voltage transients. A big generator, like size will be, dip in the voltage due to a lightning strike, 
hardly notices it. But there were some wind turbines in the south of Scotland tripped off every time there was a lightning strike anywhere in Scotland. This was discovered in 2001, bit of a problem. So they had to change the technical rules for wind turbines. Um, there was also the issue that um, a number of other, the rules, technical rules that apply to very small generators, like mega one megawatt or less that's connected to a distribution network. For historic reasons, they were different from the technical rules that applied to big generators connected to the transmission system. And so they were more sensitive to transients, they were more sensitive to frequency, they were more sensitive to voltage. Um, and uh, so there was an event in 2019, August 2019, um, where frequency went to a low level and some people got disconnected. And part of the problem was the fact a lot of very small generators got tripped off because they were sensitive to the transient. The rules have been changed and, shall we say, protection settings are being altered but there's still a residual hidden problem with the small generators. Uh, I think this is the last point, black start. If there was a national blackout, in order to recover from it, we need to have a reasonable number of power stations that are able to start up from shutdown condition with no external power, because they've got batteries and diesel generators that can provide the initial power. And they've got to be able to operate in the rather chaotic system that would happen when they tried to restore power. Um, if you connect a generator to a transmission line, there's nothing else connected to it. That unfortunately looks like a big capacitor um, and that generators are not very happy being connected to large capacitors. So there are some technical requirements of a, of a power station that's going to provide black start. And that was provided by all these coal fired power stations which have now shut down. So I'm not sure how National Grid is uh, able to provide a uh, black start. Uh, I did speak to a young engineer who works for that part of National Grid that owns some of the DC connections to France. And the newest one, he assured me, could actually provide black start. At least they were testing it and they hoped to get paid lots of money for it. So uh, this is the commercial bit. Uh, there are lots of commercial opportunities. I mentioned that Ofgem's solution is seek a market solution to any problem. National Grid have a transmission license that obliges them to encourage competition. So their approach to all of these problems is to try and define it technically and then invite people to tender. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, the government has just, or recently in July, published a review called Review Electricity Market Arrangements. Uh, I've read it, and this is my rather cynical three-point summary. It's, this is where we'd like to be. That's the beginning part of the uh, document. This is you know, kind of electricity system we want. Uh, <laughs> next bit, but we don't know how to get there. Or rather, we're not sure the best way to get there. And so can people reading this report please advise us on what they think is the best way and comment on our suggestions. I get this very distinct feeling. Um, there is a <coughs> professor of economics at Oxford called Dieter Helm, who writes a lot on energy things. And I mostly don't like what he writes because he tends to say, you've got it wrong or they've got it wrong. It doesn't actually say what right would be. Um, but he wrote a rather interesting document in 2014, which I only discovered last week, and it's amazingly uh, prescient. Um, He's pointing at all the problems that existed, and we, that's where we are now. He didn't offer a solution, <laughs> but he, he did point out the correct, you know, what, what the problems are and why it's so unbelievably complicated, and why the government's review document is really saying, please help us, we don't know what to do. Right, um, so overall summary. Back in 1990, a small number of large state-owned companies had a buy British policy and they ran the whole system. I mean, I, I know about the buy British policy because it was said to me many times. Now we have a very, very large number of companies, some large, some small, many foreign owned, in a competitive market or a heavily regulated market, depending whether their generation or network operations. And it seems to me in future, more emphasis is gonna be 
placed on providing controllability of the system, rather less on providing energy. If we have all the wind turbines built that were in that slide I showed you, there will be no problem about having enough energy. It will just make the system controllable. So we have the energy when we need it and we don't have it when we don't need it. And that the voltage and the frequency are maintained so that all our equipment works. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And I'm willing to try and answer any questions you'd like to throw at me. Yes. You uh, talked about increasing storage, yep. but didn't mention battery storage. Do you think that will play a part? I, I would like. There, there is some battery storage. National Grid have signed contracts with some very fast acting battery stores. And what they're providing is simulated inertia. In other words, they're providing sudden increases of output. Um, over a few seconds. What say Dinorwick does, it provides uh, its full output, which is about 1800 megawatts for six hours. So a full lake of Dinorwick is six hours generation, 1800 megawatts. Um, I don't know how many battery systems that is and how much it costs. There are a lot of people wanting to install battery systems, but they're all relatively small. I think one difference is they're small and they're relatively expensive, but total cost is not too bad. Um, the new hydro scheme that Scottish and Southern want to build in the north of Scotland, it's, I don't know how they're going to finance it. It's 1,200 megawatts and it's going to be more than 24 hours storage, um, but it involves building a very large dam. And I suspect it's a very large capital investment, whereas battery stores or actually, you can do them at a small, small bit at a time. It's a bit like the comparison between Inkley Sea and several thousand wind turbines. You can build the wind turbines one at a time, uh, but to have enough money to build Inkley Sea is a big pot of money. But if you've got a, if you know, uh, a design for a cheap, reliable battery <laughs> that's low loss, uh, low volume, you know, low risk, you know, you can make a lot of money. But it's got to be a lot better than what we've currently got. Yep. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a bit about the cables that go under the sea to Norway or other countries? What do they look like, or how how fat are they? I believe something like something like this. <laughs> um, I mean, they're DC, um, and generally there's a positive one and a negative one, and they're separate. So it's a positive one with an earth screen around it, a negative one with an earth screen around it. And you place them close together on the sea bottom so that the magnetic effect sort of cancels out. Otherwise, ships going over have trouble with their compasses. Um, but they are basically copper conductors with surrounded by insulation. So easy for uh, Russian submarines to just No, smash. because there was a link between England and France in the 1960s, uh, 160 megawatts, I think. Uh, and it was continually being damaged by um, anchors being dragged across it. No one realised that so many anchors are dragged along the bottom in the English Channel, but it seems they are. So the 1985, the first link to France, is buried about two metres below the sea bottom. So there was a special submarine that dug a trench and then they put the cable in the trench. Mm -hmm. And I believe most of those undersea cables are that way except where the sea is so deep, it's deemed not to be necessary. But it, it depends on the sea bottom. If the sea bottom is very rocky, you would have a job doing that. I think, I don't know what they do in that case. But... Just ask why DC? Pardon? Why DC? Um, there's two good reasons. One is an, a cable, like an underground cable or undersea cable, is a large capacitance. Um, and if you put AC on a capacitor, there's a large current just to charge and discharge the capacitance. So if you build a very, very long undersea cable, eventually the current just to charge and discharge the capacitor each cycle is greater than the current rating of the conductor. Yeah. So you cannot have very long cables. The only way you can have a long cable is in short sections. And between each section, you have an inductor to balance the capacitor. So all undersea cables are, 
except for the one to the Isle of Man. And the one to the Isle of Man isn't because it's much lower voltage. Charging current is voltage times capacitance. Uh, the other reason is, um, is that the whole of England and Wales and Scotland is one synchronized system all running at 50 hertz, all in phase. Mainland Europe is also a 50 hertz system, but it's not necessarily, not exactly the same frequency and not in phase. Um, but you can connect them with the DC connection. If you tried an AC connection, you, you would have to have three or four strong AC connections. Otherwise, it, you would always be losing sync. It would be a weak connection between two strong systems. So, and similarly, uh, Scandinavia is a separate network from Central Europe. So that's uh, HVDC connection to them. And the connections from Scandinavia to Germany are DC as well. Um, there was even a connection between Finland and Russia, but it's not in service at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, was, it was effectively a very short DC system. It was AC, DC, DC, AC, to, to connect two 50 hertz systems that are not synchronized. Only it's not in service at the moment for the obvious reasons. Yeah. Yes. It, it has any um, work been done on whether the cables that connect to people's houses can carry the aggregated load or heating? Yeah. Um, I mean, this is an, an area where the regional electricity companies, uh, district network operators, are worried at the moment. The system has been de designed with some diversity in the sense that they know that your house has got a hundred amp fuse on it. So that's many kilowatts, but they know also that in general, members of the public don't all use the power at the same time. And they've got standard calculations as using this diversity. Uh, if suddenly everyone in the road has a electric car and they all plug it in at midnight to get low cost electricity to charge it overnight, then it could cause a significant problem. Yeah, I, it, it is an area where people are worried. I can't tell you how much work has actually been done. Uh, but at the moment, the number of electric vehicles isn't so large that it's a problem in most places. Yep. Just to pick up on that, I, I think I heard a presentation from National Grid, yeah. where they're more concerned about uh, heat pumps. Because electric vehicles, they can stagger the charging times and keep them actively you you, you give you give them contracts which yes. encourage them an automatic yeah if there's with a smart meter you can do it at the right time yeah whereas with heat pumps yeah everybody's going to want their heat, heat pumps to kick in at seven in the morning that's right you can't shift those around time yeah wise. yeah so that's i, uh, I, I can i can uh, yeah an issue. i'm sure you're yeah i'm sure you're right there yeah. but the, the yeah the the car charging is definitely a problem oh, for yeah. the local networks oh yeah yeah. Yes. Do you think this current energy crisis we've got <clears throat> will actually decrease the amount of electricity? Uh, to be honest, I, if I was still working like 10, 12 years ago, I'd have gone up to our trading department, had a long chat with them to get them to explain it to me, hoping they would understand. But I really do not know what the costs are or what's driving it. But one issue is because we have a competitive market and the marginal generation is gas and gas is very expensive, it, mean, it means that the market price is very high. Whereas if we had what the CEGB was, what it charged as the wholesale price to the regional electricity companies was effectively the average cost, not the marginal cost. Um, uh, there's a very strong belief that certain companies are making a lot of money out of this. What I don't know is who that is. But on the other hand, um, Hinkley C has got what's called a contract for difference. So it's got a subsidy with a defined price. But if the market price is higher than that defined price, they will have to pay back the difference. Yeah. Uh, some of the offshore wind farms already in operation have got CFD prices higher than Hinkley C would get. Uh, so they've actually got to uh, give back uh, money. Uh, so there's quite a lot of uh, um, possibility that money is coming back. But where that money is going, it's going to a thing called the non-fossil the fuel something agency. And it's supposed to be circulated back. Where it gets to, I don't know. But if everyone's got a, a CFD, which fixes the price, then we shouldn't have a problem. But I don't see how the system's going to work. 
yeah, if I'm afraid I do not know why the prices are so high, and I do not know what we can do about it, and I suspect the government's in the same position. Yeah. yeah? Uh, just to comment that just a couple of days ago, I was listening to a podcast from Santa Fe, analyzing complex systems. Yeah. And they were, uh, they've been investigating the California electricity yeah. system market, which has had many of the same problems. Yeah. And, and the conclusion they uh, were coming to is that we can model the engineering, but the really difficult bit is modeling the human factors. Yeah. And yeah. the sociology. And that is what is actually making the system very difficult, very difficult to predict yeah. how the system. You can persuade customers to do things by adjusting the tariff but sometimes people are quite obstinate they won't do what you want even if you offer them lots of money you know uh, there are several places in the states where um, you can save money on electricity bills by making an agreement with the electricity company to allow them to have a control so it's got to be off for a long time before you really notice it um, and that's you know one way of, of doing that sort of control but definitely in um, California, well, they've got a thing called the duck curve. Uh, what that is, is got so many people who put solar panels on the roofs of their houses. It means that in the middle of the day, there's a large amount of local generation so that the by the system operator is very low because effectively a lot of the demand is offset by the solar panels. That's fine. Except that early in the morning, that's not the case. And late in the afternoon, that's not the case. So they've got the system where in the morning they need to have power stations ramp up very fast and then ramp down in midday. And then in the late afternoon, ramp up again very fast because as the solar panels drop off. So it kind of, yeah, I've, they, I've seen a graph which shows the development of this over about 10 years. And it starts off as a mild problem and has become a very big problem. Yeah. Yeah, go on. You mentioned that we have a competitive supply market. Yeah. Supposedly, yeah. And yet everybody is being paid at the highest available price. Yeah. I don't understand. No, no, that. no. Wait, holes the supplier who supplies you buys electricity wholesale and he's selling to you retail. And when he buys wholesale, some of it is on long-term contracts, some of it is on short-term contracts. Uh, and some of it is uh, imbalances that cost him a lot of money. Um, so uh, the idea of the regulator was if the supply companies can go around the generating companies and, and uh, competitively get contracts, they'll get the lowest price, so it will force price down. Um, but I, I honestly don't know how it works. In the end, um, if, if you own a generation source that can generate cheaply, but everyone else is selling at a high price, why wouldn't you sell at a high price? That's capitalism for you. That's not the CEGB, unfortunately. But the, yeah, is that supply company making pots of money? I don't know. Um, I, I don't know to what extent the regulators are looking very closely at what they're doing to see whether what they're doing is reasonable, given the fact they're having to pay very high prices for some of their wholesale purchases. Seems to me like the tail wagging the dog. It is unbelievably complicated. And I, I mentioned the paper by Dieter Held. If you read that, it's, you think, oh, no wonder I can't understand it. Yeah. Go on. Sorry, can I? Are we hearing aid? I've come by this form. I was wondering if it would be better if we, um, uh, if we privatized everything in the electricity supply industry. <laughs> would we be any better or worse off? Yeah. Um, you mean unprivate? Un yes. <laughs> Renational. Well, a, a number of countries around the world, which like us were all state owned, have gone towards privatization, but they haven't done what we've done. What a lot of them have done is have what's called a single buyer model. So the equivalent of National Grid or the National Control Center or the independent system operator effectively is the customer for all the electricity and the generators bid to supply it. Um, and then, of course, it, like the CEGB, its cost 
of units is the average of all the contracts it's sold. It tries to get the cheapest, but if some are very expensive and some are cheap, it, its actual cost is the average. And it then sells that to supply companies, just like the CEGB did, uh, the, the bulk supply tariff, uh, something that's the average of the total. Um, and a number of countries have gone that way. Um, I'm not saying it's perfect, but it strikes me that if we had had that system now, then we wouldn't have quite the huge price that we do have now on the, uh, but I, you know, I'm not an economist. And I'm not a businessman either. Yep. Doesn't, Sorry. Doesn't the French government earn a big chunk of EDF and doesn't that yes. do a similar role? Yes. In France. Uh, it, I, all I know here, yeah, EDF is the state owned, well, was the national, with well, the equivalent of CEGB. And actually, it was more like the South of Scotland Electricity Board because it owned generation, transmission, distribution, supply. Um, and they tried to partly privatize it and they separated the grid company from the generation. Um, but I believe it's substantially owned by the government still. Um, worse than that, um, EDF Energy in the UK is substantially owned by the French government as well. Um, and Hinkley Point C is 80% owned by a subsidiary of EDF Energy UK and 20% by a Chinese company. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's all very complicated. Yeah. Regarding nuclear generation, you yeah. didn't mention anything about CMRs being uh, developed. SMR. SMR, sorry. SMR, sorry, yeah. Small modular reactors. Um, I mean, I, I mentioned I've done stuff internationally. There's quite a lot of countries around the world that would like to build nuclear. I'm not saying it's necessarily a good idea, but for many of them, what's being built at Hinkley is absolutely out of the question because their network is too small. In very, very roughly, you don't want your nuclear unit to be more than about 10% of your system demand. But if you do, every time the reactor trips off, which does happen occasionally, you're likely to get a system blackout. So country, I mean, I try, I'm supposed to not mention countries by name. Um, a country wants to build nuclear. If it's some um, typical demand is 10,000 megawatts or less, 10 gigawatts or less, it really can't install any of the currently available large power plants uh, because they're just too big. So there is a potentially large market, potentially large market for someone who's got, uh, say, two or three hundred megawatt reactor that can be built for a reasonable price. <clears throat> then countries like Kenya, uh, Ghana, Nigeria can reasonably install such a power plant, whereas at the moment they can't. Uh, so there is a potential, and, th and there are a lot of people who've got designs on paper. In some cases, they've got small prototypes of various designs of reactor. Um, and some I've been to lectures on this, and they all seem very, very confident that their reactor designs are intrinsically safe. It hasn't got any of the problems of existing reactors, and it can be built economically at 200 megawatt size. Um, and there are actually lots of designs in the air, as it were. Um, and then Rolls-Royce in the UK, of course, who are, have the design knowledge for the reactors used in our submarines, um, they have been talking to the government and saying we could build a power plant of about, I think they're talking 400 megawatts, which is a bit big. Um, yeah, and they, they believe, you know, quicker to build than Hinkley C, cheaper to build than Hinkley C. And if you could get uh, so, uh, a design where you could sell several dozen around the world, then the price would definitely come down. But uh, I have no confidence <laughs> that any of these design will actually achieve that. And to do uh, the price, you know, it's the price. It's amazing how expensive nuclear seems to be. P people w tell me that they're worried about whether it can be safe enough. I think it can be safe enough. The problem is, can it be safe enough, cheap enough? That's the, that's the issue. Yeah. Silence. Any are there any questions from the far end? <laughs> the ether. And there uh, are not, apart from someone asking how they pay their subscription.
I'm unable to help with that question. <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> we, we have a huge number of vehicles on our roads. Yeah. And more and more are coming in. Has anyone done the maths to say if all the petrol, diesel driven cars that we have today were converted to electric, could we cope? So is there enough lithium in the world yeah. to make the lithium batteries that all those cars would require? Now, if, if you own uh, a salt lake Chile or a salt lake in Peru that's got a substantial amount of lithium in it, there's a large potential income. But is there enough of that to satisfy the world demand? And I think there probably is. I mean, so I've certainly seen. I mean, there's another thing. Um, Wind turbines, okay, the fuel is free, but building them's not. And I've got figures. The typical offshore wind farms we've got in, in the North Sea, they are about between 250 and 350 tonnes per megawatt of capacity. Now that's an extraordinarily large amount of metal. Most of that is steel. 90% of that is steel. Um, it's got to come from somewhere. It's got to have energy to produce it. Um, it does, uh, uh, you know, people have talked about the energy cost of Hinkley C. I'm still trying to find out how much steel and concrete they're using. But I, I think you'll find that Hinkley C is using less steel per megawatt, considerably less steel per megawatt than offshore wind turbine. So definitely more concrete. And I want, yeah, the, 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 most of them have got 20 year agreements with uh, what they call the Crown something service. Uh, I would be very disappointed if they all shut down after 20 years. I would expect them to be refurbished and run for 40, but uh, I don't know. Thank you. Silence. Ah, well, I suppose one final question. Last one, Richard. I'm mainly interested to know how close we are to being able to meet our needs for this projected future where everything's going to be electric. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things is why is our electricity demand less than it used to be? Why is it going down? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the reason might well be people are being much more efficient. People are buying A star 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 fridges when they buy new fridges. Yeah. Uh, you cannot buy pumps and fill them in light bulbs anymore. Exactly. It exactly makes sense because the population is increasing. More people are living separately instead of living as family units. So you've got you two expect to heat up. Yeah, it's not making any sense at all. What demand is going down? But yeah, new houses are much better insulated than old houses. But that's not reducing the number of old houses. Yeah, but almost everything that is built nowadays that uses electricity is more sophisticated and more efficient than yeah. it was twenty years ago. Yeah, but there's other things happening. Like back in about two thousand, there was a considerable worry about in standby modes of TVs and everything yeah, yeah. else. Not just standby, but other always on modes, a low power modes. And some work done by the International Energy Agency around that time reckon that in most developed countries, that's North America, Western Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, about 10% of the electricity in the home was used in such standby low power modes and was increasing. What's happened since then is Quite a lot of countries, and I believe that includes, I'm not sure whether it still applies to the UK and Australia, have introduced legislation to require standby modes to be less than a certain figure. And certainly, my newest DVD player is less than two watts in standby mode, whereas the old one I had was 15 watts. So, so I mean, people are improving efficiency where they can, but it requires a bit of government uh, levering to force people to do it. I have one question off the web. Uh, Chris Landerfont asks, uh, is molten salt energy storage in use for electricity? <laughs> I don't know. It's, I mean, I've heard of it. Um, I mean, there, there, not, there, not in great use. There, are, there are lots of proposals for storing energy. Uh, Passive voltage, of course, you can get the heat in and out of it quickly. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Action. Yeah, I, I don't know how you get the heat in the sand, to be honest, yeah. And there, there, there are also other things from batteries. There, there are 
I don't know what you call them, chemical flow batteries, where you have two tanks of chemicals and it goes through something in the middle and it, uh, as it goes through, it converts the chemical and that's effectively stored energy. So it's like a battery, only you could actually have a very large volume. Yes, National Power did one, it didn't work very well. I think the general lesson of perhaps the last 30 or 40 years is lots of these ideas which work at small scales in laboratories yeah. tend to be killed by the capital cost once you try to scale. Yeah, up. some of them, that, well, this, this thing that National Power tried, they discovered it didn't scale in the way they thought it would. Um, so that it was much less efficient and so on. The conversion cells, the manufacturing of those was problematic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, one final question. Anyone? Go on then. Well, I'm interested by Alex to your query as to why the demand isn't going up and up and up. And I think the answer is in your slide, which is there's a lot of generation, uh, solar and wind and other small generation tickets, which never make it above one to three two kV. So there's a clear on that. No, no, that's not that's not right. Uh, look, I that I thought that the first time I saw a graph like that, but that's actually the, the graph I showed you comes from the government figures, which are for demand. In other words, the demand as meted at customers' premises. So the demand at national grid level is going down even faster, but the demand at customer level is going down. Yeah. So does that include my mum, who mostly is supplied by her own solar panels? Uh, ah, because ah, so. In her case, what's metered is her net demand. So, yeah, so to the extent that people have got solar panels and it doesn't get out on the system, um, yeah, but it probably is the case, yeah. But yeah, all the large solar panels by the M4, they are part of generation <coughs> demand. Yeah. yeah, so when I showed you a graph of electricity demand over the 24 hours, I specifically chose. 2005 because that was the first year I had data for the whole of GB when National Grid was now system operator for the whole of GB and yet it was early enough that that demand which is demand seen at grid level didn't wasn't affected very much by small generators because there wasn't very much in 2005 only a percent or so so that's why I carefully chose 2005 as the year to show you yep but anyways, what, I, I agree with your question. It was exactly the question I asked the first time I saw the data. Yeah. They don't do it on every household basis, they have local, local distribution that is aggregated. Yeah. So surely the point about it being net energy requirement because of the solar panels is important. It, yeah, but the number of them, what I don't know is how much there is from domestic users. I don't think it's anything like enough to cause that effect. But I honestly don't know where I'd find the numbers. So, but perhaps for a future talk, Barbara, I can look at statistical analysis of electricity <laughs> demand <laughs> across the UK. Uh, well, I, I, for one, am feeling much more plugged in to the realities of electricity supply across the UK. Uh, thank you for a fascinating talk this evening. Very, very interesting. Oh, thank you. Very good. Thank you.